Hello, everyone. My name is Jeff Allen. I'm the Global Pipeline Lead here at Esri, and I'm also a board member and a TCG member of PODS. This morning, we're going to take a look at understanding the location referencing or ArcGIS pipeline referencing tables inside the PODS diagram. So basically what these are, these are a set of tables that we've included in PODS that if configured correctly, allow you to use the ArcGIS pipeline referencing tools out of the box from Esri. So these tables are in all the PODS versions of the data model starting at version seven and are a key set of tables and feature classes that turn on functionality within the Esri software that allows you to manage linear referencing data within our architecture. So to, today I'm gonna to go over these tools or these tables and show you how they, they're integrated with a larger model. Now, anytime we're looking at the pods model, we do wanna understand how the diagrams work, right? So inside of the pods database uh, diagram, you'll see a start here guide, shows you how we organize the abstract tables, the abstract feature classes, and the core tables that we then inherit into any of the other objects within the model. So read this section over carefully. This will help you guide you through the understanding of how these, uh, these tables and feature classes are configured in pods and allows you to easily navigate the model and understand what's going on. But really today I'm gonna to kind of focus on this core linear end linear referencing fundamental schema. So these are the core feature classes and tables you would need to enable linear referencing uh, in the Esri toolbox. Now it really starts with a very simple concept. We build a center line for the pipeline. The center line could be either 2D, X and Y, or it can have Z enabled as well. So X, Y, and Z along those pipelines. A lot of our historical data uh, only has X and Y coordinates, but most modern as-built surveys now include Z along those pipeline, new pipelines as well. So we can formulate into the model. So basically when we're starting, we need to get our geometric center line for our pipelines. Now on top of that center line, what we're going to do is we're going to locate a series of calibration points. <clears throat> These are basically the points along the pipeline where we have a known measure and a known coordinate. These measures might be absolute stationing, they might be engineering stationing, they may be odometer, they might be mile or kilometer points. The M value really represents how we calibrate the points along the pipeline onto that Z or XY enabled center line to build up the, the full network. Now, obviously in our model, we might have more than one center line that builds up a route or a pipeline. So there's a table within the model that has a center line sequence that allows us to bolt the center line objects to the routes inside the pods model. And a route is simply uh, a, a construct within the model that is determined by the operator where it might start or where it might end. The only real rules around routes is that they must be monotonic, meaning that the measures must be continually increasing or continually decreasing. If at any time the routes start over, like we have an equation which have overlapping measures, we need two routes. Now routes can come together to form a network or a series of lines. And onto those lines, we would then create a series of events. Events are simply objects along the pipeline that represent either a point in space, like a valve, or something that might represent a range, like a coating or a casing or the pipe material itself. This is a simple information model of how these feature classes and tables interconnect. You can see at the bottom, we had the center line that I mentioned. It's then connected from one to many relationship to the sequencing table. The sequencing table is then connected to the route feature class. And then also a relationship to those individual point features or calibration points along the center line. So you can see here, we really don't define the events at this point. This is just the core feature classes need to build up that uh, infrastructure for the routes themselves. 
Now, we support a number of different types of routes and route measures within the model. The simplest one being a continuous network. We have uh, measures that start at a, a low point, go to a high point, and there's no overlaps and there's no gaps in the network. A simple continuous network along the routes. However, oftentimes because of historical rerouting or needing the ability to hold on to historical measures, we might have to introduce equations into the lines. In this point, if we want to model equations in the pipe core pipeline linear referencing tables, we would then use an engineering station network. And what this allows us to do to have multiple routes, we might have a break in measure, but have those routes roll up to a single pipeline line feature. Now, the third type of network we have is what we call a derived network. And what this lets us do is take those multiple routes that make up that line and show it as one contiguous line network with no breaks in stationing. Now, the difference between a derived network and a continuous network is any time the engineering network is changed, if we introduce a new reroute or a new equation, the derived network is automatically going to be updated. If we didn't have a derived network, we'd have to make that same change to our continuous network to keep them in line. So most times that we have an engineering network, we would also create a derived network with it. This allows us to do easy reporting and calculations without well, having to be worried about taking into account the breaks and stationing from the equations on the engineering network. But we can still use those engineering network to place point in linear objects based on their measure. Now, when we're lay laying events onto those routes, we have a couple different uh, methodologies. One is a simple point event. I would locate some type of equipment either by coordinate and derive a measure or put it in by measure and derive its coordinate. This is a process called linear interpolation. So we can locate things by measure along the pipelines or some take something that is located by coordinate and find its measure. The second type of event that we have in the model is a linear event. And a linear event simply spans a range. So it has a from measure and a to measure along that route. Now the powerful thing about the linear referencing tables is that events don't have to stop and start on a single route. Events can actually span routes. So in this case, we would have not only a begin and an end measure, we'd have a begin and an end route ID on those linear events. The other thing we support in the pipeline ref referencing tables is the ability to locate uh, measures in Z. So in this case, we have the center line that has a vertical segment to it, meaning that two of the bends or two of the calibration points along the center line have the exact same X and Y, but they have different Zs and different Ms. So as we locate events along that line, we do the vertical interpretation between those two bottom and top points. So if I'm locating measure five in this particular example, it's gonna be halfway up that vertical piece. So from the top down, it's gonna look like it's in the same spot as if I located a, a, a ranged event from zero to four or zero to six. But if we look at the coordinates, X, Y, Z, and M, then we'll see that true 3D representation of those events through those vertical areas. So here's a simple network. We go from zero to 50 on route one and then have a re-zero on route two and go to zero to 50 again. This is probably the simplest type of network you can build using these core APR tables. Now, when we build those routes, if we have a line network, we get some more options. It allows us to bolt those two routes into a single line. So if you look in the, in the tables, uh, in the feature classes, you'll see two different route IDs, two different route names. You'll have a line order that shows the order of those routes, and you'll have a line ID and a line name that matches across those two routes. So route one and route two have been defined as line A, and it's route one is the first in the order and route two is the second. Now this is important because this is how we create the derived network. 
So in this case, we have two routes, one going from zero to 50, and then the one then restarting its stationing at 40, which you can see is a, a 10 unit overlap, and then going to 100. So the first route is 50 units long. The second route is 60 units long. So if we add those two routes together, we would have a derived network that went from measure zero to measure 110, which would be the full length of that. So if I was doing a calculation or if I was doing a report, I could see that in that derived network that this line is 110 units long. But if I wanted to see the individual measures, I could then drop down to the line networks and see the individual routes. Now we also have the ability to have multiple center lines that make up these routes. So in this case, I have a derived network that goes from uh, zero to 230. I have two engineering networks. And in this case, I would have two independent center lines. If I create a reroute on any of these engineering networks, I would break that center line and have multiple center line objects to make up a route. So this is where that center line sequencing table comes into play. I can have many center lines making up a single route, or I can have multiple routes that share the same center line. So if I make a cartographic change to the center line, let's say the first one on the left-hand side, it would automatically impact the geographic location of my drive network and my engineering network because they share the same center line object. So if my pipeline moves, all my networks are automatically updated. But what if I wanted to then simulate another type of, of segmentation within the model? Well, these tables support multiple types of networks sharing that same center line. So one of those common examples is maybe I want to represent my odometer readings along a testable segment. But those testable segments may start in the middle of one route and they might end in the middle of another route. So that's the case here. I have the launcher that starts at measure 150 and I have a receiver uh, that uh, starts at measure 15 on route two. But I wanna have a nice clean center line object between those two that I can calibrate differently than I calibrate my engineering station. This is where we have the ability to create multiple networks within the model. So you can see in this example, if I was to add another network to this model, I'd be able to calibrate that network independently of my engineering station. So here I can go from zero to 115. Uh, I would have then an equivalent point on my drive network, let's say measure 210. And then I would also have the same point represented in my engineering network, which is that launcher at 50 and that uh, launcher at 150 and that receiver at 50. And you can see in this example, we would end up with four center line objects. So this is pretty powerful. So these networks could be for odometer readings. They could be for mileposts. They could be for post. Uh, I've all also seen it done for time as well, right? So we could calibrate one of the lines per time and then bring data in from say, uh, uh, another type of device that's uh, moving along the center line. So it's kind of limitless how you do this, but it allows us to have basically multiple measures attached to a single center line route in the model. If you want to learn more about this, please visit pods.org and take a deeper look at the pipeline model. But this should get you started on understanding how we connect the core linear referencing tables together and enable those in the Esri Pipeline Referencing Toolbox. Thank you very much.